The magic's about to happen, right? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. A few weeks ago, I read a book about how habits form and what we can do to change habits. And so it was interesting to learn that once you have a habit of some kind, it's very difficult to just stop doing the thing, whatever the thing is that you're doing. If you want to break a habit, it's much better to replace the behavior that you don't want with a new behavior that does something similar. Uh, so probably I'll be doing sermons about habits at some time uh, in the near future. But this week, um, one kind of habit that I want to think about, I've been thinking about cities and about Baltimore in particular, and how a practice of getting to know and to care for a city, for a particular place, can become a habit, or at least another way to practice love of God and love of neighbor. So as we go into this, let's pray together. Please pray with me. Gracious God, you love us as we are. You love us as we will be. You walk with us each and every day. Guide us, we pray. Comfort and shelter us. And send us out challenged and energized to do your will and to seek your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you might be surprised to know that, according to author Ed Glazer, when it comes to the impact on the environment, living, living in the city is a good thing, not a bad one. Living in the city encourages us to live in smaller houses, which also means better use of energy. My house, for example, like, I don't know, 80 or 90 percent of the houses in Baltimore, that might be an exaggeration, but anyway, we share two walls with our neighbors. So in the winter, we have this amazing insulation on either side of us and totally benefit from one neighbor who cranks their thermostat way up, right? <laughs> we don't even have to, you don't have to turn it on until like December, right? Um, living in the city, as Glazer explains in his book, makes it possible for people to drive less and use public transportation more, or even walk or ride a bike to some places. In Baltimore, before the car companies bought them and closed them down, you could even get around a lot of places by a streetcar. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. These days, of course, we do have the buses, and then the light rail and the metro, but of course those two don't meet each other. But anyway, it seems like the bigger a city gets, the better its public transportation gets. Of course, it could go the other way around. It could be that the better the public transportation is, the bigger the city can get. And because we're all closer together in a city, it makes all kinds of things possible. Creative, strange, and beautiful things can come to life in a city because when so many of us are so close together, it's more likely that a few of us will have a common interest, a common spark for something unusual that you might never run across in a hundred years living in the country. Um, I think our church might be one of those things. So maybe it shouldn't be a surprise to realize that Christianity, as it first spread across the world in ancient times, was a city-based movement. Paul, in his missionary journeys, went from city to city, preaching in the synagogues, and at least in Philippi, uh, near the riverbanks, where the women were washing their clothes. That's where he preached. With more people around, there were more chances for the Spirit to work, and for Paul's voice to, open their, to reach open ears. And so our New Testament is littered with letters to people in cities, in Rome and Corinth, in Ephesus and Philippi and Colossae. Only Galatians is addressed more to a region of small towns than to a city. So why think about cities? Today, in our reading from Revelation, John of Patmos describes a vision of what the world be, will be like when God's new society finally comes into being. It's his vision of what the kingdom of God will look like when we're able to live out Jesus' hopes and dreams for the world. And what does John describe? Not a countryside, not a suburb, but a city. The city of Jerusalem descending from heaven to earth. Heaven on earth. Of course, this Jerusalem is in harmony with the land and includes a river, the river of the water of life, and with the tree of life growing on it, growing over it and bearing an amazing variety of fruits, one for each month of the year. At least according to John of Hatmos, the kingdom of God is lived out in a city. Of course, you'll notice that John of Patmos in Revelation has a little caveat in there about who and what is allowed into the city. Never again, he writes, will anything be cursed, as he wrote in our reading. The tree in the city is for the healing of nations, for the unity of the world, and the light of the city is God's own divine person. Which makes it a little different from the cities we might know. 
Because as you know, while cities have a lot going for them, being so close together also concentrates, gives us close-up exposure to all the bad things that people are capable of doing. Concentration of crimes and gangs, poverty, traffic, and getting back to the environment, a concentration of waste and concrete that puts a lot of pressure on the land and the water where the city is situated. So just because you live in the city doesn't mean everything is rosy. Of course, living in the suburbs or the countryside doesn't have any guarantees e either. But what I'm getting at here is this. Whatever our own little neck of the woods is, whether that be our neighborhood, our gated community, our cul-de-sac, our apartment building, or literally a little neck of the woods, that place is closer to the human scale and the place where in loving our neighbor and loving God, we have the opportunity to do justice and love extravagantly and walk humbly in God's presence in a way that larger places just can't quite, we can't, can't quite have the same impact. In other words, if we want to know how to best love our neighbor, it might be good to figure out how to love our neighborhood. In Greensboro, North Carolina, there's a pastor and writer named Jonathan Wilson Hardgrove, who is part of an intentional community named Ritba, after a city in Iraq, where some members of his community had a powerful experience of welcome and hospitality. One of the spiritual practices at Rutba, one of their commitments as a community, is that they stay in the community where they are. This comes from the Benedictine monastic tradition and is called the practice of stability. Stability is, allows for deeper commitment to a place. It allows you to really know the people in your community and is in some ways a rejection of the capitalist system that demands that we move every time a promotion is offered. Wilson Hartgrove, in talking about the importance of the practice, tells about a desert mother's explanation of stability. Stability, she explains, is like a bird roosting on her eggs. She needs to stay in one place, keeping the eggs warm long enough for them to hatch. In the same way, at least some of us need to practice staying in one place long enough for good things to hatch. Does that mean God wants all of us to move to Baltimore and then never leave? Uh, yes. <laughs> Or that the only righteous one is the one who is living in the same neighborhood they grew up in? Of course not. Although, those are very nice people. But where we live and our local community do matter to God. And the connections we build over time, wherever we are, are not easily replaced. So I'll close out with um, some thoughts on Baltimore. Heather and I moved to our house in Baltimore seven years ago, July 1st. So while that's a long time, it's nothing like the time that many of our neighbors have spent in their homes. But the other day, I was following a car that had one of those oval bumper stickers on it and it had like a black silhouette of a rat and then the white B-A-L-T on it. Because, you know, Baltimore has rats. Hilarious, all right? And then the car also had a license plate from a different state and then a little college sticker as well. The college will go unnamed. And then there was, so there was a part of me that wanted to like, be like, hey, rats, the rats aren't that bad. College student who doesn't really live here, you know? Because, hey, sure, we might have some rats, but there are rats, okay? You know, back off. Anyway. Move to the city. All right. <laughs> it's complicated living in a place like Baltimore. There are some really great, fun things that go on here. There's hoot nannies and bars, right, where you can just go and play and jam out. And there's the kinetic sculpture race, which happened yesterday, and I guess the Grand Prix. But anyway, <laughs> we leave town for the Grand Prix, I'll tell you that. But then somebody films this amazing, well-written, compelling, addictive TV show about Baltimore and showcases all our problems with all our in urban institutions, law enforcement, politics, education, the media, and then you have to have an answer for all your out-of-town friends and relatives about whether you watch The Wire. You know? Thanks, Baltimore. Oh, and then just, just, uh, just in the last couple weeks, there's been a smuggling ring b busted at the local jail, right? <sighs> On the one hand, great. It's great that they were caught. On the other hand, not so great that it was happening, right? All right. Hello? Okay, so that's my thoughts on Baltimore. But if we're going to work for justice, if we're going to try and make a difference in the world, we have to do it in a particular place. And if we're going to love people, it's going to have to be particular people, our neighbors, our fellow citizens. And the question is, given where we are, given what exists in the history 
and a promise for the future, what is the best way to do that? Here and now, here in this place, here where God's light is breaking through. So, as we wait for that new Jerusalem to descend, as we wait for the healing leaves of the tree of life to bring unity and peace to the world, as we wait for the waters of life to flow through our cities and our suburbs and our countryside, let's work for justice. Let's work to bring an end to poverty, an end to injustice, an end to exploitation, an end to degradation. Let's work for a city that is in harmony with the land and the waters. Let's speak up for the right thing in the places where we are. Let's learn to love our neighbors, and let's do it all with the blessing, the encouragement, and the love of the God who gave John of Patmos his beautiful vision. Thanks be to God. Amen.